Okay. So, to the agenda. Most of you have already been uh, attended our meetings in this format, but I'd like to just recap what and how it will happen tonight. For the Zoomers out there, first of all, a reminder to please mute your microphones if not already done so, so we cannot hear any background noise from you and your place at this stage. During the presentation, I ask you all to keep your microphones muted. For the Q&A session, you can ask questions by virtually raising your hand in the reactions box or using the chat function to send a message to the off host that you want to ask a question or you can type your question into the message and it can be read out for you. Please mute your microphone after asking your question. Uh, if you could hold off um, putting your questions into the chat line until towards the end of the uh, presentation, which will go for about 40 minutes tonight. Um, for those in the audience, it's just a matter of ra raising your hand, uh, but I will ask you to come to the front here, or we might be able to bring the microphone around to you. We've got a roving mic tonight, so uh, we'll try and bring that around to you, and uh, so you can ask your question directly uh, without having to come up here. Uh, we hope that works. After the presentation and the Q&A, we will then move into off general business items. Well, that's the format. The Q and A and the, and the talk will take uh, you know, fifty-five minutes to an hour. Um, so, to our speaker tonight, Susan Rind is a wildlife conservation biologist who, along with zoologist partner and researcher Murray Ellis, has a background working on hollow nesting nesting animals and nest boxes. Susan studied the rare and threatened bush brush-tailed bascagail for her PhD and extensively used nest boxes during that study. In the past few years, the pair have studied the design of nest boxes, especially the impact of design on temperatures inside during our hot summers. The duo are currently assisting their local Nurebidala Council with nest boxes in the Shire and project on gang gang cockatoos. Susan is presenting, but thanks go to Murray Ellis and Narawan Williams for their contributions to the talk. So with that short uh, introduction, Susan, I'll hand over to you. Oh, thanks, Ken. That's lovely. And your pronunciation of Fasca Girls was really good. So how's this sound? Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Everybody's got, we've got the thumbs up from everybody. Good. Good. Oh, okay. So um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm giving the talk, but uh, a lot of this work has been collaborative and done um, um, by Murray Ellis and... Um, We've spent a lot of time talking to Narrow and Williams as well. Um, and so this is this is a collective thing. So coincidentally, last week, Narrowin gave an absolutely brilliant talk for the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, and that's been recorded. And um, that's the YouTube link there. I've actually sent this to Kim. So if you're really keen on knowing more about nest boxes, I highly recommend that. So what I'm going to cover tonight is uh, why do we need nest boxes? Are they useful? Are they used? Which animals are going to use them? Are they as good as natural hollows? Um, look at some successful nest box programs. Look at some things to do with making uh, boxes, the design and installation. That's only going to be a small component because that's a big topic in its own right. But Narrowin actually talks quite a lot about that in his talk. Um, uh, some recent research and findings from our own property. I'm just south of Maruya. And some advances and alternatives to nest boxes. And this is quite, quite exciting. But I thought I'd take you back to where it all began. Brush-tailed fascigales. So if you don't know what this species is, that's fine because they're super rare. So there's a brush-tailed fascigale on the right. And I started working on those in Western Australia in the 1990s and they're hollow dwellings. So that got me into nest boxes and I have made hundreds of nest boxes. So that was my beginning. Murray's beginning started elsewhere, working for National Parks as a researcher. He was out in the Central West uh, looking at hollows and got involved after the fires in, in the Warren Bungles. You may know that the Warren Bungle National Park was burnt, 80% um, of it was burnt out in 2013 and Murray was involved with the fauna recovery research. One of the things the park 
did was immediately put in 500 nest boxes because they felt lots of hollows had been destroyed. And Murray said, well, is that really the case? And he started doing experimental work, looking at whether these nest boxes would actually be suitable for fauna. And he was most concerned about temperature. So that's where he began doing his things. And then we, oh, there we go. He was also measuring the conditions in the natural hollows and in the roosts and, and the boxes. So he was looking at natural and artificial with his colleague, Jenny Taylor. And then we started doing experimental work ourselves and testing the temperatures inside nest boxes under experimental conditions. So here you can see this one on the bottom is at our own property and there's all sorts of different designs there, different coloured boxes, um, some double walled boxes using air as insulation and we had temperature loggers in them. Can you see this box here? We'll come back to that one, but you can see it's an ordinary sort of nest box, but then there's a, it's a box in a box with an air gap. We were testing that. And that work using a box with an air gap like you would have in your house, we've just published that. And if I'm not going to, if, if um, you get to look at this, you can have a, a, a read of this, but this gives you some information about that work. But one of the things that we were both very keen on is to actually test these things and publish the stuff so people knew a lot of nest boxes are put up uh, with good intentions but they may not actually do the job they're supposed to so there's another brush-tailed fasca gale what happened uh, with this species is i found a couple of very recent records on the far south coast we thought they were extinct here and so I, using that nest box design that we, with the double walled one, we made a whole pile of boxes and put them up here. And we did it in collaboration with the council, with the school. We got the kids made the boxes. We put them up on the grounds where the animal had been seen, which was the school grounds, and the council paid for it. So it was a wonderful collaborative project. And here you can see I borrowed a camera too. So we had cameras on these boxes. So that got me working with the Eurobadella Shire Council on their nest boxes. And so since we were there, they've had us do lots of our work. So since uh, the fires, uh, we've done a lot of work with nest boxes. The Eurobadella was really, you probably know this, but really badly burned. And um, nest boxes just started turning up on the doorstep of the council. They didn't ask for them. Some of them were sent for Victoria. We didn't even know where they came from. Anyway, all these nest boxes turned up and they needed, some of them needed retrofitting. So Murray and I helped with that. And there's our place there, a COVID safe painting workshop in 2020. What also happened in 2020 was gang gangs turned up on our property. And I immediately thought, fantastic, this is great. We need some gang gang nesting hollows, but I knew nothing about the birds and nothing about gang gangs. So a, another colleague in the ACT had actually measured a couple of gang gang nest hollows. Her area of expertise is uh, parrots and hollows, and she gave us all the measurements. So we designed a gang gang cockatoo just for ourselves and a couple of friends near us and also a couple for glossy blacks. The design was based on, um, I, I did a fair bit of um, background reading to find out what the best design was, and I'll come back to this in a minute. But so we're going with, we're talking small furry mammals like Vasca gales, and now looking at the artificial hollows needed by things like cockatoos. Because I um, did that little tiny bit of work on gang gangs, I suddenly became a uh, gang gang expert. Bushfire recovery money became available and uh, we got actually a, a nice grant to do a proper trial of these cockatoos. And so here we are with the Shire Council and Citizen Sciences and ACT Parks people all doing this collaborative project. And you'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. And that work is ongoing. I was out last week checking them. Oh, sorry, I am going to talk about those now. I wasn't sure where this slide was. 
So on the left there, you can see a cockatoo. These are so different in design compared to your nest boxes. They're made of PVC um, or they might, it, a stormwater pipe of one sort or another. And the birds need a ladder. We wanted to test the temperature inside. So you can see that we made a little, uh, uh, a little area for the temperature probe to go in, but behind the uh, ladder, because gang gangs love to chew things. Uh, we tested them on the trees just, just at our own place uh, for temperature before we put them up. And I've got this one down the bottom. Don't try this at home. But this is a trial. Uh, it was done under an animal ethics permit. Unlike wooden boxes, things like PVC can endanger the animals because they can't get out. So we really wanted to make sure that these were safe. So... Um, you wouldn't want to be making one of these and trying to put them up at your property at this stage. So that's the background that's brought me to giving talks about nest boxes today. So um, I'll go into those questions I was talking about. So why do we need nest boxes? And it's, as you would know, it's just to make up for the loss of large trees that have got natural hollows. And are they used and useful? This is an important question. The answer is yes and no. Some animals really love nest boxes, the little gliders, the sugar gliders, uh, possums love them, and fascigals love them too. Antichinus like them as well. And uh, the little feather tail gliders. Uh, some animals are very fussy. They do like them, but they have to be just right. Um, and some species rarely use them. And species that rarely use them are things like greater gliders, yellow bellied gliders, your... Um, uh, powerful owls, you know, there's a whole suite of species that really tend not to use them. And some species will use them at certain times, but they they get very picky when it comes to what hollow they'll use when they're raising young. So the large mammals that we've got um, in southeastern Australia that like to uh, that uh, need hollows are your greater glider. If you don't know this species, that David Lindenmeyer calls them ringtails in drag. But there's a there's a researcher I know that says they're just like a flying muppet. They're the most beautiful, beautiful animal. And they have been listed uh, at a Commonwealth, Commonwealth level as endangered. You've got your yellow belly, yellow bellied glider. Uh, you've got your ring, your brush tail and your ringtail possums. Then you've got your, your medium-sized animals, so we're talking sugar gliders, sugar gliders, uh, squirrel gliders, and brush-tailed fascigales. And then you've got your little fellas, your feather-tailed gliders, antichinus, and your pygmy possums. And then in the mammal department, you've got all the microbats as well. I just think the pygmy possum is the cutest thing. I've actually made uh, special pygmy possum boxes and I've got some out here too. I'm, I'm looking for them in this area. They're very rarely recorded. Bats are a bit different when it comes to boxes. Some of the things I'll say about what makes a box suitable, uh, you just that doesn't apply to bats. Bats are completely different. And this is a lovely picture of the large-footed myotis, the fishing bat, and you can see them there all crammed in. And boxes for bats are quite specific. And if you're really into bats, do watch that talk by Narrowood because bats are his thing and he talks a fair bit about those. I'm only going to touch on them briefly. Yeah, there we go. Watch that presentation. And, and so I talked about mammals there and there's all these birds and reptiles. We've got um, about 115 species of, of birds that need hollows for breeding and um, a whole pile of reptiles. The, the reason mammals need them all the time, 100% of the year, um, ringtail possums will use drays, but, um, you know, bunches of leaves in trees, but mammals need them all the year. That's why they're absolutely critical for mammals. And the birds just use them for the breeding season. So there's a window of time they need them. So it is a bit different. And here we're looking at tree creepers, um, I think that's a female red-tailed black cockatoo, a uh, little pardalot and your um, powerful owl there, little owl at night jar. Are nest boxes as good as natural hollows? Absolutely not. They really aren't. 
they don't protect against the heat and cold because um, the wall thickness of a natural hollow, it, it's really quite thick, whereas an S-box is thin. Um, you may not know this, and it's really only in the last 10 years that people have realised this, and it makes such sense when they say it, that sap moves up and down the tree the whole time and it buffers the inside of the tree and keeps it cool. So you can see this thermal image of a, a koala there. And the, the tree is much cooler than the koala. So, you know, it's a tree-hugging koala to keep us all cool. Uh, natural hollows last for hundreds of years. Nest boxes don't. Well-made nest boxes might do 25 years. So I think nest boxes are good for, they're fabulous for research, absolutely terrific, because it's a good way of catching an animal without using traps. They're quite safe. Um, they're good for rescue situations where you've got got to put the animal in something and restoration and our fire situation suddenly became a rescue and restoration situation. But they don't make for the removal of the perfectly good hollow bearing tree. And this this business of the, the temperature it, with the sap movement is one of the biggest ones in Australia and the problem is going to get worse. When you have those screaming hot days, a nest box gets very hot. Have there been successful programs, conservation programs for nest boxes? They have. Um, in Europe, they've been using nest boxes for decades and they've been monitoring them. This is mostly for birds. They don't have the problem of heat that we do, though. In, but in Australia, um, Fasca gales, uh, and this 95% of my boxes were used um, by Fasca gales in my research area. Um, Small glider, small gliders, you know, the little sugar gliders, they they love boxes. Uh, lead beaters, possums, uh, of the boxes put out for lead beaters, possums, 75% of the boxes got used by them. Feather tail gliders, they like them. Pygmy possums like them. But female pygmy possums, when they have young, have a bit of a preference. So they're good for those mammals. Some of the co common problems that boxes have, um, they include, I like this one, the wrong species uses it. You, know, you, you can imagine, you know, glass only, you know, no rosellas. Mm -hmm. um, lots of birds will, will d uh, decide that that's the box they want and that's it. Uh, it doesn't get used and that's usually... Um, you, if it doesn't get used, it's a design problem or a placement problem or the animals you want to have used it aren't there. Um, or, or it's you, you're trying to get an animal that doesn't use a box. It doesn't last long, and that's a construction if, issue. Um, and predators. So you can see that cat sitting on top of the nest box. I have a picture of, of my neighbour's cat sitting on top of one of our nest boxes as well. Cats are a problem because they climb. Um, on the top here, one of the ways you can protect galahs and um, and other species love to chew them. So they'll just wreck your boxes, but you can use metal or hardwood. Um, there are ways around these ones. Oh, this one on the left, left down at the bottom there. See how it's been chewed to bits? And um, goannas. Goannas, are, you know, this one here, they're, they're great tree climbers and they get into natural hollows as they do get into nest boxes. So how do you make them attractive? Well, and this is, to get this information, Nara wants to give you some of it, but there is a lot of information online. Things like BirdLife Australia and various organisations will give you dimensions. The dimension that's really, really important with the nest box is usually the entrance. That's usually the critical thing. So for the species that you might have in mind that you want to uh, lure into your backyard or increase its numbers, you need to have the right size cavity in a box. The entrance size is critical. If they say the entrance size should be 50 mil, make sure it's 50 mil. Don't, don't think, oh, that's too small. I'm going to show you some photos, and you, you won't believe that animals can get in through a tiny entrance. Um, it needs good insulation properties, and that was the nature of the research that Murray and I have been doing. Um, where you place it and how you place it, it needs to be the right height up the tree. And depending on the species that you're working with, this often doesn't need to be that high. 
Nest boxes are often put way up trees because they're in a public place and it's to stop people messing around with them. So it's not necessarily for the animal, it's to stop the human animals getting at it. They have to be in absolutely full shade with a few exceptions. Um, the relationship to the landscape, this is where I said it, you know, the animals need to be there and or want to be there. So it has to be connected if they're an arboreal animal. It has to be connected with other trees and it might need the composition of the vegetation might need to be just so because they're going to feed on that and they might need a certain quality and quantity. Uh, the attachment, uh, there's lots of different ways you can go around this, but it needs to last and it shouldn't damage the tree. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And some species have really exact requirements. And I chose the chest, chestnut teal as an example because you really should mount their nest box over water so that when the, uh, the predators can't get at it, but also the little ones can jump into the water. Uh, this is Narrow and Williams. And he's up a tree with, I don't know what that's for. It looks like maybe a big glider box. And there's the YouTube link to his talk. There are lots and lots of designs. You can see a few here. Um, this this was our study where we did the box in the box. Um, the, this one here is a rear entry box. I'll show you that in a minute. The one on the right, top right there with the uh, turquoise parrot, um, it's got a guard at the front. And that's some birds like to just fly straight into their like a, a kookaburra, they would like to just go straight into their hollow. And so you can do nifty things that start to exclude certain species. And this one's repurposed natural locks. This down on the bottom, sorry, I, you can't see my pointer. <laughs> down on the bottom left there, that's a bat box. And you can see there's a, a, a bit coming down the bottom. The bats land on that and crawl up through the base of the box. I liked this one and it's it's Australian research and it just got published very recently. And they one of the problems is boxes have been made and put up in the, since the 1980s in Australia and people haven't monitored them. And it's just this last five years, people have really started monitoring them and looking at the design. So this is for a barn owl. And um, th these ones were put up on the edge of farmland and in an exposed position, and the barn owls use them. But the authors did say we were a bit worried about what happens when it gets too hot, but there were, there would be ways they could get around that one. You can see the, the little barn owl there with its brood patch on its chest. And these were used, the reason they did this research is they, they wanted the barn owls to be pest management, you know, to be killing their rats and mice. If you're interested in trying to attract barn owls or, or mast owls, if you've got those, um, there are designs. This is this is the UK. They're crazy about their birds in the UK. Um, it's quite a very specific design. So it's um, it's got a veranda and the depth from the bottom of the nest box to the entrance is very specific. It's to stop the little, little barn owls from actually crawling out until they're big enough and strong enough. So there was a definite height for the safety of the birds. And you can see the little veranda around, uh, the little edge around the veranda. That's also to stop the birds falling off, the little ones falling off. But you can find that on, uh, that there's a, it's a good video. And you can get, um, get the plans to make it. This story I really love, this bat story is just outstanding this is the brief brief version of it can you see this um this bat tower here on the left and the size of the man this is massive so this this was um a medical doctor dr campbell he was really worried about malaria in the u.s he's in florida in the 1900s and he said well bats eat mosquitoes so why don't we get uh, make a hotel de bat and uh they'll all come and live in it the bats will live in it and clean up our mosquitoes and so he did that and it didn't work. The bats didn't stay. So he got very depressed and he went off and did all these observational studies of the bats and went, aha, I've got it. 
So he went back with a new plan, and that was the bats need to be where the bats roost need to be a certain distance to water. So he moved the towers near to water, and they all moved in. And that resulted in, unbelievably, the local eradication of malaria. It's the most amazing story. And that was due to applying some observations, you know, it's science, really good science. And at that time, killing a bat was illegal and you'd be fined $200. I looked up what $200 would be today. That's about $6,000. It's an amazing story. Bats are quite different to all the other mammals. All the other mammals, they, they really want to be cool. They, and, and getting too hot is their problem. They, they, their uh, behavioural right, ways of getting around being too cool, they build nests, they huddle up together. They don't have a problem there with the being too cool. It's being too hot. Bats are different. Bats actually like to cook themselves a bit and they change their mind during the day and they will often be under bits of tin and for a few hours and then they'll shuffle around under the bits of tin and go somewhere else to get just the right temperature. Um, and people have had problems with trying to attract bats into boxes. There's only about two species of all our bat species that turn up in boxes. So there's been a fair bit of research done just recently. And this is one where they looked at both the design of the box, the material and the colour and the size of the box to see if it attracted different bats. And they actually found that they could attract different bats if they did some uh, modifications to the box. So if you want to make bat boxes, there's there's a, a bit of research to look at. Okay, so let's get back to these cockatoos. Glossy black cockatoos are, are endangered. They're on Kangaroo Island and they're over here in Eastern Australia. And that's a classic glossy black cockatoo um, nest box that's been used on Kangaroo Island. And they've tried similar things for the black cockatoos in Western Australia. When I was trying to look at what to do for the gang gangs, I looked at all this research and there was a PhD student who'd done a um, compare and comparison about how long they lasted, how much they, each type of design cost to make up, whether they endangered the birds. Um, sorry, just one sec. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, whether they endangered the birds, uh, whether the birds liked them, whether they used them, how long they lasted, etc. Um, so I had a look at that research when I was um, coming up with cockatoo. So inside these cockatoos, whichever design they are, there will need to be a ladder for the bird to climb out. They need to have coarse uh, wood chips as nesting material. There's the baby black cockatoo. They need to have a chewing stick. You can see um, in the photo on the bottom, there's a chewing stick sticking out the top. Apparently, if you don't put a chewing stick in, they just will not use it. And this is our copper tube design. On the left, there's the, the specifications as well. And there we are building it in 2020. Here we are. Um, Dr. Laura Rayner from ACT Parks. She was the one that did the original gang gang measurements. She uh, did all the tree climbing. And you can see the photo on the left there, how high up the tree it is. Now, when it comes to these, these type of um, nest boxes, they do need to be very high up. And can you see this photo here? There's Murray walking around at the bottom of the tree there. And there's the, in the red circle, there's the, the nest tube being taken up. And Laura's way up there. This was a very exciting one, actually, because when we came to uh, look in it, it actually had a greater glider in it. And there's Laura, Laura putting them up there. The reason I wanted to show you these ones in particular was um, this is sort of a, a, a specialist type area with nest boxes. It's not, you know, your backyard nest box. Uh, builder would be able to do this because there's a lot of um, skills like and and expense involved in employing a climber or being a climber. So with our nest, our gang gang project, uh, we've got a three year plan. We've built thirty nine of those 
gang gang cockatoos. And three times now we've gone up, uh, got the climbers to go up and have a look in them to tell us what's what's in there. We've got a whole pile of citizen scientists who are observing them because they're on their properties. Uh, and we've installed cameras in 10 of them. If you have a look at the picture in the middle right, there's a camera there and it wirelessly sends a photo to an email address once a day. And so we know every day if some, if some animal is inside that. So it's a lovely monitoring tool. We also put these Inkbird Bluetooth temperature loggers in because we wanted to know the temperature. They're terrible. Don't get them. They're really, really bad. But the camera has a temperature sensor in it. So the camera is sending us information on the temperature, which is, is the sort of data we want. So we want to know if they're being used and what the temperature is inside. So we are hoping that that information will be coming wirelessly to us for the next two or three years before the batteries need changing. Laura Rayner in the ACT parks that I mentioned before, she's doing a parallel project using the same design and she's put up 32 of these copper tubes in the ACT. Namaji National Park got severely burnt and um, ACT is the sort of epicenter of gang gang activity and she's the only one who on the camera who's got any action i i haven't seen a gang gang uh looking in our our copper tubes but she certainly has and there it is on the screen a boy and a girl so a pair of them having checking it out but it's early days so we'll just keep monitoring this is what we've been finding in them so we're not getting gang gangs but brush tail possums top there um, on the left there, you've got a nesting material. So that would have been a sugar glider. And we did have a sugar glider in one. And the big surprise was we got a greater glider in one of them there. Look at those claws. Another project we've been doing down here is to do with fasca gales. And I mentioned to you before that suddenly they showed up in the south coast and we went, wow, we've got to, we've, we've got to find out if they're really here, if they're persistent, because we don't have a photo we don't have an animal, so we've, we've actually got to find them. And so this is another sort of design, and I really like this design. Can you see where that pole is? That's the entrance. This is a rear entry box, so it's using air as insulation around the box, and it's rear entry. You'll see this against the tree. And it's double walled, as I mentioned, and we put temperature loggers in just to check. So we've made these boxes and we put them up the trees, and Next photo, and we put cameras on them as well. We did this in an area where we'd seen this, this Vasca girl. Can you see that the, the side with the hole is actually bung up against the tree, but it's got these little wings on it. The reason I like these boxes so much is because it stops predators getting in, it stops bees getting in, and it also stops birds getting in. So if you want to target your, your mammals, this is a good one. So these are rear entry boxes. I mentioned to you before that you don't need to put them really high up. This is at our place. They, these are at the height of the ladder that we used, which is two and a half to three metres. We've got cameras on them, as you can see. Um, and they, these get used. The one on the left is has been used by brush-tailed possums. The one on the right has been used by antichinus. As I said, the reason they put up high is usually... Well, it's often to put them out of the out of reach of the public. Okay, attachment methods. Uh, the, the preferred method is to use two attachment methods because one might fail. So here you can see there's a wire and a nail, and you can see that there's uh, some bendy wire around the tree. But you don't want to ring bark the tree. So this bendy wire and the wire is in a hose. You'll see that in a sec in the next slide. The hose around the back protects the tree. And as the tree grows, the wire just straightens out. And if the wire doesn't go through the box, it just stops at the side of the box and is knotted on both sides. If the tree goes really fast, it'll actually pull the box apart rather than ring bark the tree. So zigzag wire and garden hose. 
So there's the back of that same box. So if you read from the top down, you'll see it's a wire loop up the top. Here's some nest box design features. The edges are all sealed with, with um, oil or outdoor paint. I'm, I'm a painter. I like to paint my boxes. Um, if you spoke to Narrow and he likes to oil them. The reason I paint them is the paint lasts longer than the oil. But, you know, you really do need to re-oil wood over time, whereas paint, lashings of paint doesn't need to be redone. The edges of any wood, if, if it's um, ply, tend to delaminate. And so putting some metal or some damp force over the edges will help your box last. You can see the hinge here is actually tucked underneath the lid of the box. So it protects the hinge. The hinge is, the lid is the weak point of your box. So losing your lid is is the is one of the main problems. Um, and yet yeah, this is just screwed on and things like that. Okay. So here we are again. You can see the, the zigzag wire and the hose, the garden hose that just goes around the back of the tree. And you can see that on the top right picture as well. And you can make that zigzag wire. You just get wire and just bend it and thread it through a bit of garden hose. I mentioned briefly about um, when you put boxes up, if you want animals to use them, often you have to look at what the landscape is around you. Now, I imagine most of you are living in an urban area, so um, it's out, out of your control. But if you're in a rural area, you really need to look at the connectivity of the trees and things. And this is where a lot of nest box work that I'm involved with is happening. And... Um, you, you also need to look at the proximity of drinking water for the animals, depending on what you're, so bats and some birds, cockatoos and things, the distance to drinking water um, can influence whether they'll turn up or not. I know that, I certainly know from research in Western Australia with the red-tailed black cockatoos, distance to drinking water, it really predicts where they'll turn up. And uh, the, the food that your animal needs to eat, so if it's a a particular bird or it's a sugar glider you might need acacias or it, it just depends what species you're interested in and just because we've been talking about gangangs and um, cockatoos uh, gangangs eat anything they, they are amazing uh, Michael Mulvaney in the ACT is collating lots of information on diet and I think he's up to something like it's over 200 different species and they eat insects as well so gangangs They'll be fine. Glossy black cockatoos, on the other hand, all they eat is casuarinas. They, they are, the, are the most diet-specialised parrot in the world. So you have to have your casuarinas to attract your, your glossies. And once again, this is more relevant to restoration work, but you, you'd actually sit there and look at the upper story and the middle story and what have you got? Have you got seeds? Have you got grasses and all that sort of thing? and your ground covers. And the, the last bit there is um, this absolutely horrifies the rural fire service people. But I say, encourage the woody debris on the ground, lots of logs and limbs and litter and things like that, because that's good for biodiversity, you know, your insects and all that, all that sort of thing. But, of course, it's a fire risk. However, yes, there we go. So I want to show you some pictures. So we've got nest boxes at our place and uh, we've got cameras on some of them. So I just wanted to show you some of the pictures we're getting. And I would say 90% of the nest boxes of all different shapes and sizes we've got at our place have been used. We've got a couple of the cockatoos and they have all been used. All of the cockatoos that have been used have been used by brush tail possums. So that's not what we're after, but it means that the animals can get safely in and out, and that does answer one question. So these are the wooden boxes that we've got. So there's a feather tail glider, brush tail possum. Now, brush tail possums will try and enlarge any entrance to a, uh, a nest box, and uh, here's a picture of a mother and she's going to show her uh, brush tail possum, and she's also going to show her youngster how it's done. Look, the way around chewers is just that that front panel. If you're building a nest box, just that front panel, you can actually build that out of hardwood, or you can put a metal plate 
on the front with with your entrance drilled into the metal plate and that that sorts them out but look at this chomp mm -hmm. chomp and here youngster you i'll show you try this <laughs> and i had about four thousand photos they did it all night and there you can see the mother possum is exhausted <laughs> Uh, you know, I talked about entrances. This is a ringtail possum coming out of a nest box. Going back in. They like it really tight. They want themselves to be the biggest thing that can fit in there and not be followed by something bigger. So that's that's why they like really tight entrances. Uh, these are some other, oh, one of the lovely things about using cameras um, is that you can catch behaviour. Now, this is uh, an antichinus and it's bringing nesting material in. There's a little feather tail glider on another box sitting on the top. Oh, and can you see down, down the bottom of, of this picture here, you can see uh, information about temperature as well. It tells you the temperature, time and date. So you get a lot of behavioural information from cameras. They're just fantastic. And you can get them quite cheap now. You know, Even Aldi sell them for about $125. So this is a little feather tail glider. I love this one. This is one of the brush tail possums going in. It sort of summed up 2021, didn't it? 2020. They're just in the last little while, two years or so, there's been some real advances on the standard wooden nest box that we would make. And uh, this is one of them. And this lady's at ANU and she's doing greater glider work. Now, greater gliders aren't known to use nest boxes, but I think it's because we haven't made the right nest boxes and they're not high enough. So there's a greater glider on, on the left there. This box, it uses the double wall principle. It's insulated. It's got all sorts of features to make it cooler. It's the right size, that sort of thing, but it's 15 kilos. So narrow one would say build your nest boxes out of hardwood because they're durable, it lasts longer. The problem with that is the weight. They just get so heavy that it becomes impractical for everyday people to build them and put them up. If you're doing some long-term funded research or um, long-term restoration yes that makes sense but if you just want to build a few nest boxes for your backyard um, it just gets too heavy and then it becomes a bit of a safety issue this way weighs 15 kilos that box you might have heard of some of this 3d printing as well um, this was published 10 days ago so this is really hot off the press so this is Habitech. They're using a 3D printer to make these. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right and A, that first one there, they're making them modular so they just all join up, but they're using um, air gaps. They're using wood as insulators, but really what they're trying to address is the whole issue of getting too hot. And they have done this really good work in which they have tested the temperatures they get to and and they're able to bring the temperature down in in nest boxes more to be like a normal hollow so with a normal hollow inside a tree you'd be looking at a temperature something like 22 degrees plus or minus six so it can be 45 outs or 40 degrees outside and inside that natural hollow it would only get up to 28 which is completely fine for the animals and when it's cold if there's so much buffering, it'll only be you know, six degrees cooler than 22. So this is a new advent. Uh, if you wanted to buy one of these, which you could, I looked up the price today. Each single module or the first single module is about $150. And, and you can buy them as twos, threes and fours, depending on the size of the animal, and just add $100 each time, which is not bad value. If you bought a flat pack nest box from one of the nest box selling people, you might spend $65, $70. So this is not too bad.
you've probably heard about chainsaw hollows. So this is an alternative to nest boxes at all. So this is this was started in America in the 1980s. A lady there started looking at chainsawing out hollows and then putting the front of the tree, you know, taking a slab out of the tree, hollowing it out, putting the front on, putting an entrance in. And they abandoned it because so many of their trees snapped off. And so people started mucking around with this about 10 years ago, I think, in Australia. And they had the same problem that the, that the trees was, you know, suddenly the shock of having the middle of the tree it just snapped off. They've got better at it, um, but it still is a pretty big insult on the tree. To be able to do this, you have to be a climber up a tree with a chainsaw. So it's impractical for you and I. Um, but the idea is that the inside of the tree is much cooler because it's thick. So um, you can see why people are doing this. So they're getting much better at, at doing this. So cha that's Chainsaw Hollows. You'll, you'll see quite a lot of publicity about that. And uh, this is work that we did. Um, you probably know that the inside of the tree hollows out. It, the inside's, inside's dead, basically, and it's the outside that's the living part of the tree. So in Australia, you know, we have hollow hollow chimneys inside our living trees, but we don't have any woodpeckers or anything like that to make an entrance. So you've got to wait until the tree gets so old it gets a bit of rotten, some limbs fall off and some fungus get in there and make an entrance. So we said, well, why don't we make an entrance? So we went around testing these trees, just drilling up and going, it hasn't got it hollow in the in the stem of the, the main stem of the tree. And um, this is a lot of Murray's work. Uh, we drilled into, we found 35 trees that we could put an entrance into in the Warren Bungles and on the south coast. And entrances of different sizes, the bigger the, the hollow inside the tree, the bigger the entrance we'd make. Put cameras on those. And 26 different species have been using those hollows. So the advantage of this one is it's not much of an insult to the tree. The chainsaw hollow is is a bit of a shock to the tree and can the tree can snap off. This is just a hole into the tree. Um, we have published that work just recently, and um, I've got the link there if you want to have a look at that. The quickest the quickest that an animal went in when Murray drilled one of his hollows was four hours. He put the entrance in, and four hours later a feather tail glider went in. I think I've got a picture of that. So this is the, this is this holy work we've done. So down the bottom on the left is the publication. That's the detail there for you. This picture on the left hand side here with this graph, that uh, red line going up and down is the temperature outside, and you can see it at, at its maximum. It's pushing pushing towards forty, and you can see that blurry line right in the middle, showing the temperature inside the hollow. The, with the uh, drilled entrance. So it really does tap into um, a, a cool space. And here are a couple of pictures. We've got a um, a sacred kingfisher was very keen on one of our hollows and spent, I think it was a few days, just digging it out the whole time, just digging the mud guts out of the hollow. It was very, very keen. And down the bottom on the right side is a, a feather tail glider going in. There's a, a temperature probe in this. That's what that bit of string is. So this, this has never been done before, this this idea of actually putting an entrance into an existing hollow inside the tree. This is all on the main trunks of trees. I don't think we did any limbs. Um, and, and there's another, this is called quite a lot of publicity. This is called hollow hog. So if you have a look at the picture in the middle at the top, this is an implement that's been made that dr drills a entrance in, and then, then the, the machine somehow um, gouges out the centre. So it's a bit like the chainsaw one, but without all the drama of the chainsaw and things like that. Um, and you can see on both the right picture and the one down the bottom, uh, he's, he's put something into the, into the hole. We found this too, that over time the tree will try and heal that hole. So you've got to just sort of ring bark it or, or do something around that entrance to keep it patent for the animals. And that's the end. So I am more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has.
Thanks, Susan. We'll cast around the audience and uh, see who's got a question. Can we, um, is anybody online coming through, right? No. Not at this stage. Any questions? Matt, up the back. We'll get the microphone to you, Matt. I think you might have. Yeah. Hold it up. Oh. Um, hello again. Um, bees, what, what do you do about major feral bees coming into the office? Did you hear that, Susan? Yeah, so the question that was asked was bees. What do you do about feral bees? Uh, I think the first thing to do is find out if you've got a problem. It seems to be that some places they just don't have a problem with bees at all and other places they're a complete pest. Most of the people I talk to don't have problems with bees. If you do, um, it depends on the species you're trying to target, but those rear entry boxes are an option. The other thing that where bees have been a, a problem in boxes, it's often short-lived. And um, what... Um, one place I know, bees moved into a box and um, moved out and, and the sugar gliders just moved in and ate all the honey. <laughs> so so um, before you worry about bees, just see if it is an issue for you. Uh, do you know what, what sort of animals you might be trying to encourage in your boxes? Uh, general, I guess. Um... In Sydney, there's quite a problem with feral bees. With them, and that's yeah. why rather than before too long, we are freezing the bees. Yeah, um, there are some designs that involve baffles inside the box that can help with bees, but I'm, it, it may the box may not be suitable for some species if you're trying to attract them. But there there are some designs that are designed to interrupt the bees flying. Direct, they like to fly straight in. Okay. So, so there's some design features, and um, and as I said, rear entry certainly will will sort that out. And if they do go in, they will leave. Right. I hope, hope that helps. Yeah. Um, just... Oh, oh, one one of the other thing is, uh, sometimes people say put carpet on the inside of the lid. That's what I was going to mention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's not recommended. Because um, small animals can endanger themselves and get caught in the fibres. Okay. Yeah. might one, one trick you might like to try, it certainly works with wasps, is to use something like Vaseline or grease on the inside of a lid and okay. it makes it a bit bit difficult. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Hope that helps. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Jeff. Yeah. Right, thanks, Susan. That's a uh, great talk. Um, I've made a couple of boxes over uh, the years. The first uh, you know, ones that were wind-tailed possums. And uh, one box was very successful and has been for a number of years. But the entrance got chewed out. Uh, the possums still like to go that big one. And the second one was uh, also an issue about bees. And uh, that box has never been successful. Uh, I cleaned it out and I think it was a big deal of it. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing and understanding you. Um, the, the second uh, box I had, I did get bees in it, and uh, even though I cleaned it out, uh, it's never been successful. Um, but I think it addressed that, that question uh, and last uh, response. And the third thing I was going to ask was I uh, also had some bat boxes. Shunt cloth on the inside of the backs to cling on to. I don't know whether that's a good idea or not, and uh, it makes a difference. Uh, Kim, can you tell me what was said there? I, I really couldn't make it out. I understood you have a ringtail box that w the ringtails really loved it, and uh, you maybe had a second one that, that got damaged. Not here. Uh, yep, and the third one was uh, the question of putting uh, shade cloth on the inside so the bats could cling to it. 
Well, I'd be very careful about that. I, that would just be entanglement. Okay, all right, that's good. Um, all right, I can remove those. Um, so the... Um, so you had an entrance that got chewed out? Yeah, the entrance got chewed out. The back okay, that, that that's where I would use your, your, your lump of hardwood or a... Um, so so make a hardwood panel. And you know what I've done with some? It's, it's you know, just an ordinary ply box. I've actually got a, an additional bit of hardwood and I've used bolts and screws and just made a hardwood plate and just added it to the front of the box. Okay, all right, that's and, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the the, the, boss, the, the brush tail, sorry, the, the ring tail would still love to, to be in there even though they've chewed the, the entrance out. Um, so that's good. And one final question is, uh, what about temperature for those cockatoos? Do they, because they're plastic, do they tend to get hotter than other, other forms of uh, boxes? Um, look, they, they, they run at ambient. So they've been, they've been put up the trees in full shade. Okay. But they just run run at ambient temperature, which is which is as far as I'm concerned, it's too hot. Look, even though I've 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 designed them and and we've put them up, I'm not actually advocating them. I wanted to trial it to see if it had potential, but as well as that, if it doesn't, I want to be able to say, look, this is this is a waste of time and money to do this for this species. the The glossy blacks is a bit of a different story. They're winter breeders. So it, it very good success on Kangaroo Island using things um, using these for for glossy blacks and some of the West Australian black cockatoos might be winter breeders so they don't have the heat problem, but the gang gangs are breeding during spring and summer. So I'm I am sceptical as to whether they will be useful. Okay, thanks very much, Susan. That was great. Uh, and the last last question. Oh, did you? Uh, Deb, you want to unmute and um, ask a question? I've got it there, Deb. Yeah, yeah. So, Susan, I'm, I'm interested in your design for the rear entry and if that's available. It should be, Deb, it should be because it's been around a long time. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't our design. Um, mm -hmm. the, bit, the bit that is uniquely our design, and I do not know if anyone has picked it up other than the, the very recent work, is the having an air cavity around Mm. But but the rear entry has been around a long time. Mm. And and is there um, any kind of information on diameters for you know targeting particular mammal species or yes you know, yes so absolutely that that's pretty readily available if you do a little bit of a search. Right. Okay. You know, you, there, and, there'll be there'll be tables and things there. Yeah, and generally uh, possums glide uh, in the in the shade and microbats in the sun. Um, Mounting them. <laughs> Uh, the first is correct. Uh, it, with the microbats, the best to do, the best thing to do is to actually give them options. Mm. So, so um, you can have boxes that look. There's one that I've, I've just recently seen. That's uh, can you imagine a box on its side with two boxes on the end, and mm -hmm. one one bits in the sun and one bits in the shade, and oh, the, okay. the the bats sort of you know go yeah. along the tunnel and move around inside it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Okay. Right. Great. Well, thanks, Susan. It was a great talk. Thanks. And the work you and Murray are doing is fabulous. It's oh, thanks, Deb. Thanks. Uh, all right. Looks like uh, that's it for questions. Um, fantastic, Susan. My, my pleasure. Now, uh, Kim, I've, so I've sent you an email that has um, the various scientific publications I talked about today and and a link to Narrowin's talk. But if you want to build nest boxes, watch Narrowin's talk. It's really good. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, I received the, uh, the email with the four papers um, attached to it and um, further information. It looks pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive too. Uh, so we can get them distributed out um, to the members. Um, email or uh, whatever we might put them can we put them on our website or um uh, no probably not because they're probably under copyright but just distributing to them to your members is um certainly yeah just sure fine yeah for those um who want to follow up on it all um okay that's terrific i'd like to now call on sonia Baxent uh to move a vote of thanks uh for your fantastic talk yeah. susan Hi Susan. Hello uh, there. Hi there. On behalf of Oatley Flora and Fauna, I'd like to thank you for your fabulous talk. 
I think we've all learnt a lot. But I think one thing that really um, is reinforced to me is that we have to work really hard to protect those old trees in the first place. And here in Sydney, it seems we're fighting a losing battle with lots of mature trees always getting taken down. And um, I know it takes 90 years for a tree hollow to form. So even though the science and the technical aspect of the nesting boxes is amazing, it just doesn't obviously compare with the real thing. So that's what we work very hard to do. And I'll be very interested to hear if you have success with your gang gang project, because I've got a friend who's been trying to breed gang gangs for 30 years, and they're pretty tricky to try and get to breed. And I think my favourite thing tonight was the, um, the bat box that um, eradicated malaria in the local area. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. And it's been fabulous. And I think we've all learned a lot. And if you were here, you'd be getting an Oatly Floor and Four in a calendar to say thank you. So oh, th thanks very much. That's lovely. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, all. Good night. If you want to withdraw, um, stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, can we have the lights back on? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Do this. Okay, we'll move into the general business section. Better? Maybe not. Uh, general business section of the meeting. Um, some of the campaigns and issues, the latest with those. Um, the first one being the proposed changes to the Georges River Local Environmental Plan 2021, uh, euphemistically known as the reduction of the FSPA revisited two years down the track. Council is looking to reduce the foreshore scenic protection area, which will allow more blocks to be subdivided. Council's plan titled Help Us Implement the Biodiversity and Foreshore Studies would result in a loss of greenery and biodiversity. So over 3,300 homes could lose their current safeguards. In 2020, over 500 people protested uh, by lodging submissions against a similar proposal by Council and it was rejected by the local planning panel. And I hope most of you remember that episode um, a couple of days at the local planning panel and 500 people, well they didn't all speak, but they received the submissions and um, that convinced them to put it off, put that proposal off, reject it. But they did call for more studies. So once again, we need large numbers of people to write submissions opposing the reduction of the FSPA and a reminder the closing date for submissions is now the 31st of March, which we got extended from before Christmas. Uh, but that is now, after we've had our holidays in December and January, it's rapidly approaching, so it's less than six weeks away. Um, we'll try and get uh, information into the off uh, newsletter on the Facebook page and um, come up with more. Uh, Deb Andrew is c contributing to some of the uh, commentary on the biodiversity studies and what they propose to do with those. Um, and we'll extract that and, and try and get it out to everybody. Um, the unique character areas have a lot uh, a lot of um, hairs on them. Uh, they're very subjective. Uh, there are whole swathes of uh, areas that I believe have been left out um, and they should be included. If they're going to create these unique character areas, they need to be included in those um, so that they still enjoy most of the uh, protections that they currently receive under the FSPA. Um, it's proposed that 1,049 lots currently in the FSPA will, FSPA will not be included in either of the FSPA or the proposed UCAs. The study has also proposed that the FSPA zone controls in Georges River LEP be weakened to exclude environmental values when considering 
a DA. So uh, that's coming up. As I said, we're gathering expert advice and evidence and, and we'll share it through the various communication channels that we've got. So please watch the OFF website um, and the Facebook page and emails for updates on advice on this campaign and make sure you submit your comments prior to the deadline. They don't necessarily have to be full of expert commentary. Uh, it's enough, I think, for everybody to say that we've been enjoying the FSPA and the biodiversity and the greenery that it's kept in our area for uh, 30 years and uh, we don't want to lose it and we will fight to, uh, to keep it uh, and put that in your submission and um, we we'll hope we can become successful. There are some things in the biodiversity studies that propose um, uh, improvements, uh, as I understand it, um, and if we can get them, uh, the corridors that they've proposed, uh, coupled with um, incentive programs for the private properties that um, could receive incentives to plant trees to go in those uh, biodiversity corridors, uh, we could come out of it with some sort of uh, a positive um, conclusion amongst those aspects. So uh, watch this space, um, do a bit of background reading and um, please keep up to date with that issue and um, send in your submissions. There's a whole website on the Council's, um, a few web pages on the Council's website as well uh, with background information and you can get hold of the biodiversity studies and the, um, in the character area studies on that if you want to go into more detail. So that's that one uh, coming up very quickly. Koala protection campaign, um, just a, a recent update. Campbelltown Council has discussed stage two of Len Lease's Mount Gilead development, which will pose further threats to the ever expanding chlamydia free koala population. Presently, their habitat corridors are being fragmented, meaning these already endangered animals face further hazards, e.g., having to negotiate busy up and road. Because the public lodged an amazing 700 submissions, including protests from OFF and many of our members, the Council has wisely decided to defer the matter so they could study them in greater detail. This is a huge win for the Campbelltown Koala Colony and for other native wildlife and shows that elected representatives can and do listen uh, at times. So once again, uh, people power, the number of submissions, numbers count. Uh, in this game, I think, especially at this time of the uh, electoral cycle, um, when we're partway through the council cycle, but we're coming up to the uh, state election. So uh, if you can get these off to um, copy in um, uh, New South Wales elected representatives, that adds a bit more weight. Um, I've mentioned the Sydney Art Space and Koala Network, which OFF has joined uh, with a memorandum of understanding to become a collaborator with the SBKN, uh, and that was established by the Total Environment Centre and WIRES, uh, in conjunction with WIRES, with the aim to protect and expand connected driving koala core habitats and corridors. So they come up with um, workshops and uh, events and uh, campaigns in various areas and they're uh, sort of underpinning the Campbelltown area campaign as well uh, and getting as many people as they can um, to uh, contribute to the, um, uh, uh, the infrastructure that can be put out there for um, the koalas. So that's another thing to uh, keep a watch on. Any other comments on koalas? Um, I should be doing this on the phone, I know, but uh, a bit old fashioned. Glenn Lee. Um, a number of you would have been at the um, event at the Lugano Uniting Church on Saturday um, and that was uh, put on by Friends of Glen Lee. Uh, quite a few councillors were there 
and um, candidates in this coming state election with a um, Labor candidate and the you know, Greens uh, were there to listen in and see what uh, was to be said about saving Green Lee. Uh, a wonderful talk presentation by Heather uh, Goodall um, uh, went into the history of um, uh, back and the background for Green Lee and the First Nations presence on the, uh, the Lagana Peninsula, uh, which figured prominently in uh, one of the first um, meetings between the Europeans, Philip Gidley King, coming up the George's River and meeting the uh, local populations uh, around Lugano and, and very close to Glen Lee. Uh, we've got signs, um, placards um, that people can take home. Um, I think we've got a few up the back. Um, and then that, we can get more uh, of those from the Nature Conservation Council and other groups that are, um, are supporting us in this campaign. Um, the, one of the key issues right now is the interim heritage order uh, that has lapsed and so the Glenlee uh, land is sort of uh, free, free, free falling, you know, if you like. Um, and so uh, the minister has been asked several times to, um, if not extend the IHO, the Interim Heritage Order, uh, while it's waiting for its heritage listing, to implement or grant a new Interim Heritage Order uh, to get some more protection on it. Uh, the problem with that is uh, that when it went to the Heritage Council, uh, they suggested they didn't um, put it to the minister to uh, approve state listing at the time. They put it off and they, they're waiting for more information and assessment of the natural and the Aboriginal heritage um, values of the site. Now, to do those two uh, studies, assessments, um, somebody has to be allowed to go onto the site the owners have refused consent uh, for people to go onto the site to assess the natural heritage and the architecture, the Aboriginal heritage values. However, the minister can override that and use his authority to um, authorise council to go onto the site to do those assessments, but the minister has refused to do that to date. So we need to keep putting more pressure on the minister to uh, have those assessments undertaken and give council the authority to go onto the site. Um, so that's one of the key issues that we all need to keep writing to the minister about. Um, so, uh, and that's the latest on Glen Lee. The other issue, of course, is the issue of funding. Scott? James Griffin is the Minister for Heritage, yep. Um, He's, um, yeah, environment. No, no, no. Well, at the moment, um, Matt um, King is environment and energy. Am I right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Six weeks. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but the funding, funding is the biggest issue. Um, if we don't get that from three levels of government, you know, and the state government in particular, now's the time to approach them. Uh, next week, I think it is, there's a, a forum in the Sydney Town Hall, um, and it's put on by jointly the Nature Conservation Council, Total Environment Centre, and um, uh, I think a couple of other umbrella. Uh, nature organisations and uh, it's a, an election campaign launch. Uh, all the key issues uh, that they want um, uh, the candidates to address if they, and when they get into government and uh, there will be uh, candidates there um, uh, telling us what, uh, what they're going to do for us for nature. Um, so uh, it'd be good to get a good roll up of um, people 
in the town hall next week. Um, we can go online and RSVP. Uh, they keep saying tickets are going fast. Uh, so secure your place in the town hall and let's hear it from the politicians, see what they're going to do for us uh, on that issue. And uh, we'll probably take the Glenlee, Glenlee posters in there and um, T-shirts and um, script for Glenlee. It will be a local issue, but it might get some... Um, some well, it's uh, an eye-opener for me, living in an industrial town in Lincolnshire. Uh, all the space and the mountains and the water and, and the simple life that the people are in. It's a great education. Twenty hitching through the highlands on my Christmas holiday. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you wanted to imagine monsters, it would Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a brief, we've got calendars up the back for sale. Yep. Okay. Bear that in mind. Um, so, spare sign with some of the wrong to put them in the yard. I think there are other ones available. Probably about 100 at home. <laughs> <laughs> one here I don't want to take home tonight. But who wants it? What do I bid for it? Okay. <laughs> Nothing. Nobody wants it. It'll be up the back if you don't want to make yourself known right now. Yeah. Um, okay. Coming events. Uh, Vicky, do you want to say something about your walk? 26th of February, Sunday, the 26th of February, the Forest Park walk. Well, so um, this Sunday, yeah, is the first walk of the year, I suppose. The forecast is pretty good for Sunday. Um, the first walk of the year, I suppose, is the Forest Park at the National Park. And the end of the walk is on Sir Bertram Stevens Drive. Um, and the first walk of the year, I the entrance is on Sir Bertram Stevens Drive, where it meets with Lady Carrington. So you can come from Portley, and it's on your right. Or if you come to Waterfall and you turn left off the hill, it will then be the entrance will be on your left. There's a bend in the road, so be careful parking. You can park on either side of the Bertram Stevens, but um, the entrance is at the fountain. There's also a stone sort of ruins and an entrance way at the back, so that's where we'll meet. Uh, about 9.15, 9.20, we want to get away about 9.30, so it doesn't get too hot. It's only a short walk, less than 5 k's. Reasonably easy, lots of shade, maybe a little bit of up and down, and it also will depend on how much rain they've had, but I think we should be pretty good. So, the usual things, same like shoes, hat, water, walk out, some food. There's no water or toilet, so can't be here. And um, we'll stop somewhere on the track, near water, perhaps, because we'll be going past Older Creek and the beginning of the um, the um, walking mill. So we'll stop somewhere for snacks or lunch on the way. And then at the end, you can sort of do your own thing, go somewhere else in the 